This is meeting number four of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Citizenship and Immigration. To ensure an orderly meeting, I would like to outline a few rules to follow. Members and witnesses may speak in the official language of their choice. Interpretation services are available for this meeting. You have the choice at the bottom of your screen of either floor, English or French. If interpretation is lost, please inform immediately and we will ensure interpretation is properly restored before resuming the proceedings. The raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen can be used at any time if you wish to speak or alert the chair. For members participating in person, proceed as you usually would when the whole committee is meeting in person in committee room. Keep in mind the Board of Internal Economy's guideline for mask use and health protocols. Before speaking, please wait until I recognize your name. If you are on the video conference, please click on the microphone icon to unmute yourself. Those in the room, your microphones will be controlled as normal by the proceedings proceedings and the verification officer. When speaking, please speak slowly and clearly. Uh, today, the committee is continuing its study on the recruitment and acceptance rates of foreign students. It is my pleasure to welcome both our witnesses uh, appearing before the committee today. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Christian, President African Scholars Initiative, and also His Excellency Dr. Khalil Rahm, uh, Khalilur Rahman, High Commissioner of People's Republic of Bangladesh, High Commission for the People's Republic of Bangladesh. Uh, welcome to both of you, and uh, sorry for those technical difficulties. Um, both of you will have five minutes for your opening remarks, and then we will go into round of questioning. So I would start with Dr. Christian, President of African Scholars Initiative. You can please start. You will have five minutes for your opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Dr. Christian, we cannot hear you. If you can please start. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. We'll start okay. the class. You have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and honorable members of this committee for the privilege to appear before you once again to discuss a very important issue relating to growing difficulty faced by foreign students from Africa to secure study visa to pursue education in Canada. No interpretation? Interpretation is back. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, on November 30th, 2020, I appeared before another sitting of this committee and raised some concern with regards to high study visa refusal rate for applicants from Africa, especially at the Canadian visa office in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm privileged to appear before this committee again 14 months later to report that things have changed, sadly, not for the better. In illustrating the difficulty or growing difficulty faced by African students to secure study visa to study in Canada, I'm going to use Nigeria as a case study. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa. It is among the top 10 source countries for Canada study visa, specifically number three after China and India. It is the only African country on the top 10 list. It also has the lowest Canada study visa approval rate on that list. For example, Korea and Japan are on the top 10 list. At a point in time when Korea and Japan has 95 and 97% study visa approval rate, Nigeria had a dismal 11.8% study visa approval rate. For many years, scholars, academics of African descent in Canada, as well as stakeholders have sought answers or reasons for the high study visa refusal rate from Canadian, Canadian visa offices in Africa. That answer seemed to emerge on October 2021 when the IRCC Anti-Racism uh, Employee Focus Group report was released. That report noted among others, one, that racism in IRCC had impact on processing of immigration applications in certain countries, two, widespread reference of African countries, day 30 
by IRCC agents. Three, stereotyping of Nigerians as particularly corrupt and untrustworthy by IRCC agents. The reports specifically noted additional financial document requirements for applicants from Nigeria as part of the discriminatory rules reflecting on, IR, on racism in IRCC. This fact was evident in a recent federal court judicial review case relating to a study visa application from Nigeria. I refer the committee to the case of IREPEN versus Canada Citizenship and Immigration. Further evidence of the discriminatory policy relating to study visa application can be seen by comparing two IRCC study visa program. Number one, the student direct stream known as SDS and a similar program known as the Nigerian Student Express NSE. The financial requirement under the SDS requires the applicant to show the, I quote, have a guaranteed investment certificate of 10,000 Canadian dollars. Now compare these to the financial requirements under the Nigerian Student Express, which is a similar program by IRCC for study visa application in Nigeria. The applicant in, under the Nigerian Student Express is required to produce a bank statement showing the existence of, I quote, equivalent of 30,000 Canadian dollars for at least six months. So the applicant from Nigeria is required to show proof of fund three times more than that of the applicant from the SDS countries. And yet when these applicants overcome this high burden of proof, most of the application or study visa application from Nigeria is still refused. Madam Chair, I recommend the IRCC anti-racism focus group reports to this committee. And I have submitted as my exhibit to the committee, both the final copy as well as the draft copy of this report. That study will greatly help or assist this committee in contextualizing the real reason behind the high study visa refusal rate by IRCC visa offices in Africa. That reason, Madam Chair, is the elephant in the room. It is racism. I know my time is up, up so I'm not gonna um, spend more time. I'm also uh, gonna stop here and then welcome further question on the issue I have raised as well as other issues such as the Chinook as well and, and also the use of uh, artificial intelligence technology by the IRCC visa offices and the impact these technologies Thanks. are actually having on study visa application. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Christian, uh, uh, for your And we will now proceed to our first round of questioning. Uh, we started a bit late, but uh, we will. I will make sure that we complete this first round of question of six minutes each. <clears throat> Mr. Chris, Christian, you, uh, you may, made a, a serious allegation that there is a discriminatory policy uh, uh, in, in IRCC. Could you tell us how the minister and the department uh, should intervene to fix that uh, situation? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member, for the question. I just want to state that I'm not the one making the allegation. This is fact that was uh, evident from a report that was funded by IRCC itself which is the IRCC anti-racism focus group report. That report established the fact that there's racism in IRCC and it cited examples. Nigeria is a country that was specifically cited as an example. I may also refer you to uh, actually page, um, page two of the draft copy, not the final, the draft copy of the report. I serve that as part of the exhibit to my submission. One question there was, uh, is there race IRCC and the simple answer given throughout all group the answer was a firm and clear yes so I'm not actually the one making the allegation it's actually the fact from IRCC own report yes we have contacted the minister uh, over this we are a group of Nigerian professors in Canada Canadian universities about 30 of them wrote a letter to the IRCC minister last November raising concern about the uh, contents of this report uh, what we got was uh, a clear denial from the minister's office that that was not the case, even though the report actually stated that was the case. I see my time is up, Madam Chair. Thank you. We will now proceed to Mr. Brunel Desep. Mr. Brunel Desep, you can go yes. ahead. You will have six minutes for your round of questioning. Merci, Madam President. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses here for this study, this very important study that we uh, hold dear. I'm going to go ahead quickly. Um, I've had discussions with some immigration lawyers, and I was told that the burden of proof in providing when the demand is made, that the burden of proof is higher to have chances of being accepted, specifically for documentation with regards to the financial abilities. And um, you spoke um, in your opening statements about this. So if you apply from the Philippines or Bangladesh, you'll need six months of bank statements. But for someone from Spain, for example, they have to provide a proof of financial resources. I'd like to hear you speak to this. Isn't this the evidence that we are facing systemic discrimination, a certain form of racism with regards to um, people asking for study permits? I'd like to hear you both speak, but Mr. Christian could lead, perhaps? Uh, thank you, Honorable Member. Um, yes, the issue of uh, financial requirements and documentation uh, if I may also refer to the IRCC report, was actually one of the uh, one of the issues that was raised in terms of discriminatory treatment of um, applicants. In the case of SDS countries, all you just need to show it. Here, I have a GIC guaranteed investment certificate of ten thousand dollars to meet the financial requirements. In the case of the requirements under the Nigerian Student Express, you are required to show that you have. $30,000 within a period of six months in one year bank statement. So even if you prove that I have $30,000 today in my account, you don't meet that requirement. That $30,000 have to sit in your account for a period of six months. In the case of GIC, I mean, uh, SDS countries, you just need to produce a GIC statement or maybe to make it easier, a check, certified check. $10,000, I have it to meet the requirement. Whereas the other person, you have to wait for six months, have that $30,000 in six month period over a 12 month time to show. That is clearly discriminatory. I mean, asking one person to show $10,000 and asking another person to show $30,000, there is no justification for that. So what we're actually asking is at least have the requirement harmonized. And it's even bad or worse, when the person that has the higher burden of proof still exceed that proof or meet that proof. And yet there is nothing to show for it in terms of approval rates. They are still having worse approval rates than even the other countries that have lower uh, standard of proof when it comes to um, the financial requirements. Mr. Brunel Decep, you have three minutes. Oui, Monsieur, Monsieur Raman, je sais pas si vous vouliez ajouter quelque chose. Mr. Raman, I don't know if you have something to add with regards to this discrimination uh, that we are, are facing here, and, and many students in Bangladesh who would like to study here are facing this discrimination. And, uh, oh, vous êtes sur uh, mute, Monsieur Raman. You are on mute. Uh, Mr. Rahman, yeah. uh, we okay. can't hear yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, please. Yeah. I just Go ahead. heard it in, in French, but I, I, if I understood whatever I understood, because it was. Uh, Mr. Good. Brunel Decep, I've stopped the clock. If you can repeat your question. I think there might be an interpretation issue. He might not hear the interpretation. Mr. Christian, rather. When I think of the um, testimony we have before us, maybe you're not able to answer, but you do represent an association, an African association. One way or the other, we believe that there is discrimination uh, from Francophone Africans asking for permits. And we realize this, where there's a, a high refusal rate from some West African countries. If I think of uh, the Ivory Coast, Cameroon, uh, the Senegal. so. Our resources and uh, treatment centers also be responsible for this discrimination, or processing centers, rather. Uh, thank you, um, honorable member. Uh, there are many problems relatable for the low approval rate. Uh, some of the problem may be attributed to resources. For example, most of these countries that have low approval rates 
the study permit applications are not pro processed in those countries. They are processed in other countries. So IRCC, of course, has attributed that to uh, resources. If this study permit application can be processed in the source country, individuals in those countries will have better understanding of the unique circumstances of the applicant in that country to be able to make a decision. So that is a problem that could be taken care of by having this uh, processing localized. But at the same time also, we must also be conscious of the bigger problem. And that is why I keep referring to the IRCC report. Because even if you bring the processing to the local countries, and we still continue to have those problems that were highlighted in that anti-racism report, resources will not solve those problems. Issues of bias and discrimination and are embedded, they are systemic based on that report. So that is why it is very important. We are recommending that the minister take steps to address those fundamental issues raised in those reports, in addition to the one you have highlighted, which is, of course, resources. Thank you so much. Uh, quickly, so this means that you would be in favor, for example, of the creation of an ombudsman position for immigration in Canada. That way, uh, people will be more protected. Absolutely. I 100% agree on the creation of an independent ombudsman to oversee activities of IRCC. Merci, Monsieur Christian. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Thank you. Uh, we will now proceed to Ms. Kwan. Ms. Kwan, you have six minutes for your round of questioning. You can please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and I thank uh, the witnesses for their presentations uh, as well. Uh, I'm first going to go to Mr. Christian. I think that it is very striking, uh, especially when you highlight the, the differential treatment for SDS countries, where the requirement is thirty thousand, uh, sorry, ten thousand uh, dollars in terms of bond, uh, and then with uh, Nigerian with a Nigerian stream that the government had introduced, the requirement is a $30,000 requirement, three times the requirement than that of the SDS country. Do you have any idea of why there would be such a differential treatment in terms of the dollar amount being applied? Um, thank you, MP Kwan. I have no idea. Um, I did an access to information request to IRCC trying to get information with regards to the Nigerian Student Express program. I got through the document release disclosure from IRCC. I went through every page of those documents to try to find the justification. I found none. Thank you. Do you mind submitting uh, that, those documents to the clerk so that all committee members could receive it as well? Absolutely, I will Thank do you. that. Now, in your presentation, you were just about uh, to talk about the art artificial intelligence system, the Chinook system. If uh, that, based on the Polera report, the, the report that you cited, where there are issues of uh, discrimination uh, and bias and stereotype uh, attitudes amongst IRCC uh, officials, uh, if IRCC officials then go to produce these artificial intelligence uh, systems, what are your concerns? Uh, thank you very much, uh, MP Kwan. Let me quickly state that in addition to being the president of African Scholars Initiative, ASI Canada, I'm also an assistant professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Calgary. And my research or my field of specialization is on artificial intelligence and law. So this is one area I have a professional expertise in. I have research on implication of race and artificial intelligence. That's my major focus of my research. Now, one thing about artificial intelligence is this. Artificial intelligence technology is trained with data. And the problem, they say computer term, garbage in, garbage out. When you use a racist data to train an artificial intelligence technology, what that technology simply does is to regurgitate that racism or that discrimination. And that is the concern I'm having with regards to the use of that technology by IRCC. Data and statistics, of course, the report has shown one, the low approval rate for African countries, the racism and discrimination evident from human review of this application. If we train an artificial intelligence technology using this data, what we're going to have is a regurgitation of that same problem, this time not by humans, but by technology. IRCC has not even made things easy because the entire use of technology, Chinook and artificial in intelligence, it's embedded in secrecy and black box. I have done access to information requests for these documents and they have been pushed back. 
the last response I got was to give an, an 160 days extension. I don't even have access to this to be able to tell you, oh, uh, MP1, this technology is amazing or this technology is discriminatory. I can't do that because I don't have access to those data. So it might also help if members of the committee, of course, you probably have more access to those data than I do and those technology that I do to take a look at it and then maybe probably come to a conclusion. But what I'm saying is this, there is very serious risk in use of those technology by IRCC now because of the problem with regards to this dismal approval rate and of course the black box technology behind the black box behind those technology. Perhaps we could uh, get your request for information questions uh, from you and then for the chair to submit that to the officials so that we can get the response for this committee because I think that information would be critical for the purpose of this study. Um, and related to this issue, in the previous panel, we also had witnesses who raised concerns around uh, IRCC's, um, uh, the findings of the Polaro report and what the implications are for artificial intelligence systems. They were uh, proposing that one, that the government halt the use of Chinook uh, at this time, and B, that there should there be an independent assessment of the ar artificial intelligence system. Would you support those uh, suggestions? And do you have additional suggestions to add? Based on our dealing with um, IRCC so far and general information relating to IRCC, uh, MP1, I'll be in support of any third party oversight, oversight of activities by IRCC. And this is where we have a problem because there has not been that third party oversight. That is why this problem keeps getting worse and worse. Federal courts, yes, is there to oversee you know, decision if and only if members bring a judicial review application. But we have seen cases of study permit refusal where members have gone to federal court, succeeded in overturning the decision. The federal court sent the decision back to the visa office. The visa officers will refuse the application again on the same reason or some other bogus reason. And federal court doesn't even have the capacity, very limited capacity to be able to make a kind of, you know, directed verdict, which they have been very reluctant to use, of course, because of the principle of separation of power, judiciary and executive. So if there is a third party, independent third party to ombudsman to oversee activities of um, IRCC, whether it is the use of Chinook, I think that would be a very good way to do what IRCC is facing now. As long as that independent oversight is not there, we will continue to have this problem because it is the same people who are making this error that continue to make the error that continue to make the mistake without even any attempt to get out of it. Thank you. Before interrupting, time is up. Uh, I've been able to check with the services and we can extend the meeting a little bit. So we will have like a shortened second round before we proceed to the second panel. We will have two minutes each for uh, Mr. Helen and uh, Ms. Uh, Kayabaga and then one minute each for Mr. Brunel Desap and Ms. Kwan. So we will now proceed to Mr. Helen for uh, two, uh, two minutes. So Mr. Helen, you can please proceed. You will have two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to both our, um, to His Excellency and uh, Dr. Christian. Dr. Christian, thank you so much for um, everything you've been contributing and, and Your Excellency as well. Um, we've been having the same concerns, Dr. Christian, and, and a lot of the same frustrations where, uh, as you had mentioned, that you've been reaching out to the Minister's office and there's been no replies. This has been a very frustrating process, especially to address such a serious concern of racism. Um, can you please elaborate a little bit more on what steps you've taken to address uh, these issues and what kind of responses that you've been getting? Um, we've taken uh, many steps. Um, uh, in no November last year, uh, a group of um, Nigerian professors, a group of Canadian professors of Nigerian day saints wrote a letter to the minister. That letter is part of the exhibit I submitted to this committee. That was shortly after the uh, the IRCC report was released. We drew the attention of the minister to this report and urged the office of the minister to take steps to address this concern, especially as it relates to Nigeria. And the reference is made in those reports, specific references made in those reports to Nigeria. Uh, we got a response, of course, after many months from the minister's office. The response we got was denial denial, denial, even things that were very clear from the report itself were denied that later. So, so which these are not allegations, these are facts. 
we are not making allegation. We are more like reinstating the facts on this report, as well as facts from other access to information report. We got like the Nigerian student express the requirements that the applicants have to uh, uh, um, uh, write English language examination, even though the primary language of instruction in Nigeria is English language. So we raise this concern. Of course, there has never been any serious uh, response to the concern other than denial, which actually prompted our letter to the committee on this matter too. Thank you, uh, time is up. We will now proceed to Ms. Kayabaga for two minutes. Ms. Kayabaga, you can please proceed. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to thank both of our witnesses for being here today and for taking the time to um, uh, indulge us in this discussion in our study. Um, I want to ask this question to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Christian. Uh, thank you so much for your information and expertise. Um, and you. just also want to clarify that um, you're speaking on the RCC report um, specifically to the discriminations that uh, and the disapproval rates that um, African students receive. Um, so you did talk about the um, artificial intelligence. Um, one, uh, what kind of oversight are you um, or would you suggest would be best to to make sure that if um, uh, as we have the, the two reports from RCC that have uh, found uh, discriminations and racism, um, what would you suggest would be the best um, oversight to this um, system, the Chinook system, both in our, the artificial intelligence system, uh, to actually get to to accomplish uh, to, or to remove the, the discriminations and racism against African students? Uh, thank you very much, uh, a, mem a member, for the question. Um, my ability to answer this question will be very limited because I have zero idea about the artificial intelligence technology IRCC is using. So I may not be able to provide specific answer to that question. But in every case where use of artificial intelligence technology is involved, it's often important to have an independent body of experts who oversees the technology, the algorithm. That body should be independent from the user or the organization using the system the artificial intelligence system itself. So if we can have an independent body of experts who oversees the design of this technology, the development of the algorithm to ensure that this racism or the data I use in training this technology does not feed bias, discrimination and racism on the algorithm, that would be very important. And let me quickly go to the Chinook case, which is a very good example. Okay, I see that my time is up from the MPs. Um, chair, I appreciate so your answer, I really do. Thank you. We will now proceed to Mr. Brunel Decep for one minute. Mr. Brunel Decep. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank the witnesses for being here. It will be my last time to take uh, the floor. You've been very eloquent and you've talked uh, uh, according to your expertise. I'd like to come back to you, Mr. Cristio. Uh, because in the last series of questions I asked, you said that you do support the creation of an ombudsman position for IRCC. Um, how could this improve things for you and uh, according to you? Uh, thank you very much um, for the question. Um, my concern, I'm concerned already about the discrimination, the bias and discrimination against African student when it comes to study visa application. My major concern is having those bias fed into technology. That is, very, that, is, that is very serious because as humans, we tend to have this concern that, you know, once technology makes a decision, that decision is bias free. It is not. When you use a bias technology a data to train technology, it regurgitates those bias. So my concern now is that already there is report showing bias. Let's make sure we don't transfer that bias to the AI technology um, IRCC is it subsequently or eventually going to be using. Thank you, Dr. Christian. We will now end our round of questioning with a minute with Ms. Kwan. Ms. Kwan, you can please go ahead. You have a, a one minute for your questioning. Thank you. Um, my question is to Dr. Christian, and thank you so much for your expertise on this. No question, there needs to be independent assessment, both for any artificial intelligence systems, uh, and then also an ombudsperson to review IRCC matters. So, so two separate issues. Uh, with respect to um, applications, the government also has this thing called dual intent. Are you familiar with that? And what are your thoughts on it and what needs to be done? 
I am very familiar with dual intent. Uh, I'm a lawyer and uh, part of my practice, of course, uh, in, in, include um, immigration law. So dual intent means that um, if somebody is coming to Canada to study, they also have the intent to become permanent resident after that. That is perfect and fine under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. But I warn, I warn study permit applic applicant from Africa, do not ever bring the issue of dual intent in your application. If you do, it's gonna come back to haunt you. With regards to dual intent, the problem we are having is that dual intent is being misinterpreted by IRCC decision makers. And that is what is sad about it because the law allows for it, but if you express that intent, you are likely gonna be refused study visa to Canada. So okay. all I said them. Sorry for interrupting, time is up. And with this, I would like to thank uh, both our witnesses, Dr. Christian and the uh, High Commissioner for the People's Republic of Bangladesh for appearing before this committee and providing us your important input. Uh, with this, this panel comes to an end and I will suspend the meeting for two minutes uh, so that the sound checks can be done for the second panel. Ms. Kwan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, before our witnesses um, uh, leaves this panel, um, I would I'd like to invite them to submit additional documentations that they think would be relevant and useful for the committee members' consideration. Uh, and the uh, because time was limited and you did not sort of get to give the full answers that perhaps you might wish to, if you have any supplementary items to add to the questions that were put to you, uh, please submit it to the clerk so that we can receive that in full. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kwan. Please direct the questions through the chair. Um, uh, yes, for both the witnesses, uh, if uh, there is something you would like to bring it to committee's uh, notice, uh, uh, please uh, send, you, uh, uh, send your submission to the clerk of the committee and that will be distributed to all the members and we will take that into consideration uh, as we uh, continue uh, this important study. So with that, thanks once again to both our witnesses and I will suspend the meeting for two minutes and let the clerk uh, do the sound checks for the second panel. Thank you. Thank you very much.